Welcome to this shipping container home live stream. Oh God, there's the sun. Thank you. It's so cold out here today. I've got my hardcore, mostly unnecessary in Florida Eskimo sweater. <sighs> shipping container home on the homestead, right? And, uh, Obviously, it's still a work in progress. Obviously, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Today, I'm going to be doing some live planning and research. Live planning and research for the shipping container home. The main focus right now, December, is my month for forecasting the next steps. That's what I designated December for. Um, right around, I think it was the end of November... I finished crane day and all three containers were placed into their basically mostly final location that I call that reaching the top of the mountain but <laughs> just because I'm at the top of the mountain doesn't mean that a treacherous descent doesn't still await me and this is where I'm at I'm at the top of the mountain <laughs> I'm sorry to get all analogy for you here but and now I'm looking down this treacherous descent and I'm trying to determine what, uh, what the plan is. What is the forecast? What are the next steps? The last thing I want to do in the shipping container home build is to do something out of order. So I've been doing a lot of research. You guys were here for the last live stream where I fleshed out some of the next steps, namely in terms of, in fact, let's go, let's, let's go, let's go. Namely in terms of, uh, correcting, correcting the gaps that were left after crane day. As you can see, we got some gappage, a little bit of gap after the crane set them down. As you can see over here, a little bit of gap. Well, uh, about a week ago, uh, using, using a come along, which I'll show you in just a second, we grabbed a come along and we squeezed the containers together and we got rid of the gaps and it was a lot of important information that had to be gathered there actually let me get the tripod there was a lot of important information that needed to be gathered um, from that come along test you know I had a lot of concerns what if I squish the containers together and if I close the gap on this side, what if it causes the gap on the all the way on the other side to widen? So I had to do a lot of testing with the come along to really confirm that just by, if I grab the come along and I start hooking containers up together and squeezing them together, was it gonna cause any problems? And overall, Really good news on the come along test. No issues. For the most part, closing the gap on one side with the come along was not um, causing a crazy discrepancy on the other side of the shipping container home. Now I'm gonna put you guys here on the, uh, the good old tripod. I'll show you guys the come along in a second. <laughs> Cheap ass come along from Harbor Freight, but it uh, seems to work quite well. So, so, so I want to say thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, let's uh, open up this container. Yeah, and yes, it, it actually is cold enough to justify this big ass jacket. Ass door. So the main focus today, the main focus today is 
planning and researching for cutting out windows, doors, chopping down walls. Um, again, my whole purpose with the month of December was to forecast ahead and make sure I am, I'm doing everything in the right order. There was a possibility that it might have been smarter to cut the walls out before squishing the containers together. Come along. There is the come along right there behind the ladder, as you can see. Harbor Freight, <laughs> 30, uh, 35 bucks, cheap as hell. It's allegedly it'll winch up to like 8,000 pounds. It's a four ton capacity. We didn't even need <laughs> a fraction of that, it seemed. It really didn't take much to uh, get rid of these little gaps here, to squeeze these containers together. It was surprising. So $35, uh, four ton, uh, come along from Harbor Freight. Again, there it is. So that's going to be really important um, in a future step because I'm going to squeeze the containers together right here, eliminate that little gap, and then I'm going to actually weld the containers together there. So, yeah, that's it. I mean, it, it's it's it, it's crazy, man. I mean, we're we're getting close to like some real, you know. It's been quite the journey so far, and it's we're we're finally getting close to actually building a damn house, <laughs> you know. First, it was just you know months of foundation work. Technically, it wasn't. Technically, it was only like I think it was only like twenty five days of actual work days on the foundation. <clears throat> But obviously I have some other things I have to do. Sometimes you're just kind of sitting around waiting for an, a, an order of rebar to arrive. So you want to, uh, so it kind of, it, it, the foundation was finished in about 25 days over the span of about three months, 25 work days. Pretty intense. It doesn't include research and planning and all that other stuff. So yeah, I, I really am getting to the point now where with the foundation done, with the containers on the foundation i'm really getting to a point now where it's like okay finally going to start <laughs> a building a house now yes the foundation is part of the house but the actual home that you live in is actually finally going to start coming into action now so it's going to get it's going to get crazy it's going to get intense uh should be good should be fun so in my in my forecasting, my planning for the month of December, um, I want to make sure that I don't do it out of order. And obviously, I cannot cut out any walls. I, for that matter, I, I cannot cut out any windows or doors until I know the exact model of window and door I'm going to purchase. For obvious reasons, there's. There's little nuances in the, the size of the door and, and uh, you know, all, all those little fine details when you're really finishing installing a window and a door. You need to, you need to look at the manufacturer's specs. You need to look at the, the manufacturer's installation manual with the specifications on the widths of the door. So I cannot cut out any window or door until that point, until I get that information. So that's part of what I'm going to be doing here today. Um, let's, uh, so another thing I was considering doing was, uh, maybe putting some, some pieces of tape that kind of roughly outline the location where the openings are going to be, the window and door openings. Maybe put some pieces of tape up on the walls here for where the for where the openings, the cutouts are gonna go. That's one thing I was considering doing. Um, you know, right about here there's gonna be a kitchen window. And a lot over there is the front door which at the moment I think is gonna be some kind of a double sliding glass door. It's not gonna be your normal 
kind of hinge and open door. It's going to be like a double sliding glass door of about 12 feet width in total. It's like a big glass entrance, let a lot of light in. Um, of course, over here in this corner is technically a little pocket where the bathroom is. Let me, uh, we got some chat activity here. What part of Florida are you building? I am just south of Lake Okeechobee uh, in Hendry County. Hendry County. A um, little pocket here where I live is, uh, they're, they're fairly container home friendly. Um, obviously, you still got to get your plans and your, your stamps and your approval and your permitting and your structural calculations, you still gotta go through a process, but they actually allow you to build container homes, probably because this is a fairly rural area. Indeed, this area is, it's, it's zoned by the county as rural residential. Literally exactly what I was looking for. So, I lucked out, and honestly, I think that this area might be the container home mecca. Uh, I'm not sure there's any other place with this many container homes being built in such close proximity. I'm going to guess there's 30, maybe 50 of them out here. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, anyways, so yeah, that's, that's where this is happening. Um, so what I'm thinking about doing today, one thing I'm going to consider doing is just to give me sort of a visual sense of what needs to be cut out. I might get like some pieces of tape and sort of mark sort of the general outer, the general outer edges of where the cutouts, where I'm going to cut out the windows and doors are going to go. Because that's that step's coming really fast. <laughs> that step's coming real quick. Starting to cut out the windows, the doors, and the walls is coming. It's it's fast approaching. So I really need to figure that out. Ramon in the chat says, I think I've seen some in Cluiston. Well, I'm I'm about a 20-minute drive from Cluiston. Even though as far as the address is concerned, I still my address still writes, you still write Cluiston. So I'm not sure what exactly you mean by Cluiston. If you're talking about the town center. I don't think there's container homes there. I could be wrong. This is like a more isolated rural offshoot of Cluiston, where they definitely allow container homes. Last I checked, anyways. Maybe they changed their mind. Maybe they changed. I don't know. Ramon says, I'm in Jacksonville, and it's been hard to find an area that would allow it. Well, again, uh, I don't know how far south you're willing to move, but uh, I, I don't know of any other place in the world where this many container homes exist within such a close proximity. <laughs> but again, you probably need to isolate yourself a little bit. You know, it seems to be sort of a correlation. The more remote you get, the more lax uh, codes and things get. Not that they're lax in the sense that they're not looking out to make sure you do things properly but that maybe they're more open-minded to a bit of an unconventional structure like a shipping container home. And that certainly seems to be the case here. If you're watching, be sure to smash that thumbs up video. It seems to help the algorithm a lot. So smash the thumb up. And uh, yeah, so what I'm gonna do now is, I think I'm gonna jump back into the RV camper and do some some internet research work, which of course you're you're coming along with me. Uh, but um, I, I think that's the next step, really. Uh, and I and I might go ahead and using the 3D model, I might get the the general rough numbers of the dimensions of doors and windows, write it all down, and then come out here and put a few, maybe just some pieces of tape at the four corners of an opening, so I can look at it and be like, okay. That's roughly kind of where the, where the opening might be. So let's go inside and let's do some, some internet research. Some internet research. Thank God for the internet. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure this container home build would be possible without it. How did people used to do things without the internet? 
How did people used to do things without the internet? <sighs> it's like another world. Hey, Fritz, thanks for chiming in in the chat. There's the well. $3,800 to get that well drilled 80 feet deep. It also includes the price of a submersible pump. So, you know. Hey, if it lasts a lifetime, then it's, it's, it's a good investment. You know, it's $3,800, but what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? <laughs> winter coat in florida yeah yeah i know it's kind of extreme it's a little extreme but it's it, it is it is freezing today so all right definitely not wearing this in here though that's for sure so <clears throat> yeah next phase next phase of this of this project Definitely not wearing that. <sighs> Internet research. That's pretty interesting, Ramon, that you're looking for a place that will allow it. That's pretty interesting. Have you been searching a lot and it was really a, a real hassle? Or did you, did you just start searching now or something? Uh, so cool. You can see the container home out there. All right. Let's uh, jump in here. Um, hmm. So, yeah, it, it's freezing today here where I'm at, just south of Lake Okeechobee. That's right, Bill. Fritz says, I just got in from New York. Boy, did it snow. I'm sure it's freezing. As you can see, we have the wonderful 3D model. Load it up and ready. Load it up and ready to go. Because I'm going to be needing that. There we go. The wonderful 3D model. Um, as you can see, I currently have the rebar exposed on one of the columns. Uh, make a 3D model. If you're going to build a shipping container home, I recommend it. It's it's an it's an it's a it's a shockingly valuable tool. <laughs> it's it's almost shocking how valuable. I'm not I'm not sure uh, printed drawings ever came close to something like this. I don't know. Make a 3D model. I had to learn SketchUp. Um, it, it wasn't that hard. So uh yeah so we'll, we'll be jumping into that in a little bit um when i'm gonna get the measurements what i'm gonna do now is i'm gonna do a little bit of because you know i was um in fact i'll show you this right now i was thinking about um i was thinking about what well, this is one of the things that i'm currently sort of studying and researching and I guess you guys can give me your opinions if you have any. What's up, Tony Joyner? Thanks for tuning in. Yo, I'm building a reefer trailer home in north of Lake Oki. Interesting. I don't even know what a reefer trailer <laughs> truck is. North of Lake Okeechobee. Wow, that, that's a lot of miles from where I'm at. <laughs> it's a big lake. Um, it's a massive lake. Ramon says, I've been looking for a couple months, and the struggle I've had personally is not being so far out in the boonies that schooling for my son would be very inconvenient. Yeah. Well, isn't schooling going remote now? I mean, <laughs> I have unconventional views about schooling, so it's not, I, I, I don't view being out in the middle of nowhere as a problem, even for any future children I might have. I might have kids. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> but I, I, I have unconventional views about schooling, so I don't I don't even think it's a problem to be far away from a school. GGG says homeschool. Yeah, and I'll even take it a, a, a step further than that. But uh, we live in a crazy times right now, and 
remote schooling is is a new it's a thing. It's a thing, and I don't think it's going away anytime soon. And uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I just maybe something to consider. You know, it's uh, you know may, maybe in the future it's just going to be normal that kids learn things remotely. You know, and that's a whole other topic I'm not going to get into right now because I could go on for quite some time. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it. You know. Fritz asks, how close are you from a town? I'm, I'm about 20 minute, 20 minute drive. I don't mind it. People drive an hour to go to work five days a week and then an hour to come back home. Again, that's another thing that's kind of getting decimated by this modern era we live in. A lot of people are working remotely now. Uh, but for me, you know, 20 minutes, go into town once a week, get things I need. It's, it's not even, not even the start of a hassle, really not even, not even, and, and there's a, there's a, there's a couple schools in, in the town, if you're into that kind of stuff, so, so hurricane shutters, so obviously I cannot cut out any windows and doors on the shipping container home until I know the exact model of window and door that I'm going to purchase. So that, that, that started me down the rabbit trail of what kind of window and door am I going to purchase? And that includes, you know, should I get these kind of hurricane resistant impact windows or should I just get a normal everyday kind of window thing? Bill Bowlin says, what about rain? Will it pull up on top or can it drain off? As the container home sits right now, it's it, there's probably going to be some pulling happening there it's a flat it's obviously a flat roof um i mean i haven't taken into account any curvature of the earth so may, maybe if i took into account the curvature of the earth it, there might be a little bit of sloping happening <laughs> uh, that's a joke um it's a flat roof it's a flat roof and there probably is going to be some areas where there's puddling there's, there's you know but i that was one of the things i did a ton of research on like a week and a half ago is what do you so there's a gazillion structures in the world that have flat roofs go to your average commercial shopping center office buildings etc they have flat roofs it's a thing it's been a thing for a long time after a ton of research my current plan is to use a silicone a silicone um a silicone sealant. Now, after a lot of research, I found something for a product from a company called Henry called Tropicool 887. It's a silicone sealant. They say it lasts 50 years. Who knows? Even if it lasts 25 years, I'm pretty happy with that. And it not only seals the roof from water leakage, but it's, it even resists puddling when puddling happens. And there's probably going to be some spots where there's going to be some puddling. Eventually, I'm sure it evaporates. But uh, when it's not evaporating, uh, this, Henry, this Henry Tropical 887 silicone sealant is supposed to work really, 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 really well. Um, I did a ton of research on it. I'm, I, I feel confident in it. Um, Check regular PTG windows. Hmm, don't even know what that means. PTG window. Well, let's type it in. PTG windows. Oh, wait. I got to turn on the hotspot here. Give me a second. I'm pretty sure if I turn the hotspot on, it's not going to eat in very much into the, uh, into the live stream feed. I don't think it will. It's not like... Like I'm watching videos, though I might watch some videos because videos is such an exceptional form of research. It really works well. All right, let's see. Let's find out what a PTG window is. Hmm. Okay, it looks like it's an impact resistant type thing. It's an impact resistant type of thing. It's an impact resistant. I want to say thanks to everybody who smashed the like button. Um, YouTube basically has said that matters. So, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, okay, so it's an impact, huh? PTG. Oh, so it looks like it's a brand or PGT. Yeah. I, I typed in PTG. So wait, let's go back now. Let's confirm. Let's confirm. PTG. Okay, this now I'm I'm getting results for PGT. Maybe you meant PGT. I don't know. Um, but it looks like it's an impact, impact resistant type of thing. Uh la 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 yeah. Uh, and, and you know, and this is this is a really this is something I wanted to show you guys. So it it, it occurred to me the other day that my shipping container home is actually one giant <laughs> hurricane shutter. <laughs> it, it it just kind of hit me the other day. I'm like, wait a minute. Shipping container homes are literally a giant hurricane shutter. Have you ever seen like a hurricane shutter? Those panels. It's corrugated steel. I mean, I don't. It might be aluminum. I'm not sure, but it's corrugated metal, just like a shipping container home is. So I, I found that very interesting, and so you know, it just the idea occurred to me. It's like, well, you know, it's almost like a, sh a shipping container home comes with free, complimentary, <laughs> complimentary hurricane shutters, because when you start cutting out windows and doors. And then the interior walls, you start chopping those down, you're left with a lot of panels of corrugated metal that you can use for so many things. Not least of which is as a hurricane shutter. Now, I live in, you know, kind of south central Florida. I'm not really sure how you would geographically coin that term. But it's an area where hurricanes have hit and can hit. So... Some type of hurricane shutter is definitely something that I'm thinking about. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot, there's some people who have actually used the actual panels of what you cut out of a shipping container and they repurpose them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, Fritz. Use the cutouts as shutters. That's exactly right. People will actually take the pieces they cut out for a window and then they'll just take that piece and they'll use it as a hurricane shutter. And you know this is a <laughs> this is a sort of a very very simplistic approach. The guy he literally cut them out. Let me uh let me get that in shot here. He he, he cuts them out, <laughs> and then it's hanging by one side as a flap, and then he links it over here with a hook, and then whenever it's time to shut her up, you know you unhook it, and then you latch it over on the, <laughs> on the other. That's it's. Hey, it's one way to do it. Um, it's it's kind of cool, actually. Um, but then I saw I started looking into it more. I'm like, what if what if what if we can do something interesting? And I actually, um, Max, he's a think outside the container viewer. He actually lives out here in the area, and we met up a couple weeks ago. And he he actually said he's like, you can use. He said use the use use the cutouts as a giant shutter. But put the shutter on like a track. <laughs> you can slide it in front and you can open it. So, and that would actually work out fairly well. Given a lot of the stuff with my container home at the moment. So, we take a look over here. You know, I, it's, I actually have a perfect gap between here and here. That is just big enough, I think, so that if I did have a sliding cane shutter, it can slide and it would fit just perfectly in between. And when it's time to shut her up, you just, it's on a track and you just slide it and lock it into place somehow. And then boom. And that's not only hurricane resistant stuff. That's also... Uh, security for the house it's theft prevention it it it'll it'll help convert the container home into a steel compound that's all shuttered up when you need it i really like the idea i don't know if i'm gonna go with the sliding track option yet you know i could have right here you could have the uh it, it'll be like an extra panel on top that kind of will just blend in to the corrugated outside of the of the shipping container and of course over here with this window i just have a panel that slides this way 
And then when I need to shut her up, I just slide it over that way. It gets a little complicated on the back of the house. I'll get to that in a second. Over here, it works perfect. I believe that the windows are about four feet wide. We got two windows here, as you can see. And it's about a 12 foot gap. So more than enough room to slide this one over, slide this one over. And of course, <laughs> when it comes time to shut her up, you just slide them. <laughs> it would be really cool is if it was like electronic, it was like motorized. <laughs> so I just press a button, remote control, and the whole house just turns into, <laughs> the whole house turns into tank armor mode. N not just for, not just for hurricane uh, resistant stuff, but just for security. You know, you kind of live in a rural area. You maybe don't have that many neighbors around to keep an eye on things. So you, you got to leave for half a day, <laughs> press a button, <laughs> it's like a Batmobile or something. The house suddenly turns into a freaking... So this just... That's a bit extreme. I don't think... I mean... I, I don't think I'll ever go motorized. <laughs> but I may do the sliding track thing. <laughs> that's right, Triple G. A red alert button. Um, now, the now the only problem with that would be when we get to the back of the house. Now we, get, we, we, we encounter some potential problems here. So you can see here... The, the, the back door is actually like a couple feet smaller, I think, if I recall, than the front. It's about a foot and a half or two feet smaller. It had to be that way. It was just something that came out between me and the structural engineer as we were going back and forth about a year ago. Well, actually, I think a little over a year ago now. It's, it's crazy. Um, but you see here, now we, <laughs> now we run into some problems here. Because let's say I had a sliding panel of corrugated container home cutouts that covers this back door well where does it slide you know what am i just going to slide it here and block permanently block this window that's not a good idea now i haven't done the measurement let me do the measurement right now i'm going to see if maybe it'll fit in here <laughs> yeah so you see it gets a little complex on the back but let's just do a quick measurement and find out can't recommend 3d malls enough i mean it's just beyond useful uh where are we at all right we are talking a distance of about looks like 120 inches which is what 10 feet yeah i think it's about 10 feet or 120 inches is the size of the back of the door is the width now let's see if i have 120 inches between these two windows the, the windows themselves are still a problem. <laughs> maybe it'll have to be like a, maybe it'll be a panel that goes up. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's a fun idea. I just really like the idea. But I don't know if I'm going to ever commit to that. I don't think I'm going to do that. At least not the freaking motorized one. And I'm going to show you guys in a moment some example photos I found on the internet of people who have reused shipping container cutouts as hurricane shutters oh uh, shit it's not what i wanted to do oh that's right well that's not a problem that, that don't matter um by the way guys i hope the connection's doing okay i hope that you know it's going through well i have the hot spot on from my phone to get internet here and I hope the 3D model isn't doing anything crazy to the internet. I don't think it is because the model's already loaded up, so it shouldn't be a problem. All right, here we go again. Where is the, there it is. There's the straight vector. Straight vector. So 116 inches. 116 inches. Hmm. This was 120. But keep in mind that the hurricane shutter, I mean, I'm guessing, really just has to cover the glass. It doesn't have to cover the border. So I could probably cut that off the total distance. It might fit <laughs> the panel to cover, the hurricane panel made out of corrugated steel cutouts of the container itself might actually fit perfectly between these two windows. I just have to find out, figure out a way to, Anyways, that's 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 a whole other thing. So, I like the idea, but who knows, right? Who knows what what I'll do in the end? 
Um, okay, so I feel like I was uh, connection is great. Okay, cool. Connection is great. So, okay, hurricane shutters. So this is one very interesting approach, very simple, straightforward, right? Then I saw this, and it looked a little more intricate. So it looks like he's got some kind of track or something. And then here you've got the, an extra layer of the corrugated steel panel, but it looks like he welded it or connected it somehow to tube steel all around. So it kind of becomes this big kind of burdensome thing. Then you got to buy the tube steel. Because see, that's a that's one of the common criticisms of shipping container homes. You know, criticisms. So-called criticism. Sometimes I think it's just like bitterness. I don't I don't understand. Some some people really get triggered by container homes. But one of the criticisms of oh, you cut all this steel out, all this excess wasted steel when you have to cut out the windows and the doors. I mean, yeah, there's a bunch of steel you got to cut out if you're going to cut out windows and doors. But first of all, I mean, I don't know about you, but having a bunch of steel lying around seems like a very, very good resource to have, especially if you've learned a little bit of welding. Like that's, that's really, that's very useful in my opinion. So I don't mind. But again, it kind of, it, it comes with the cost of the shipping container. And again, the sh shipping containers can be so inexpensive. It's not, it just doesn't seem like, I mean, what do you, cons I mean, what is the criticism that it's like a waste of money? Or is it that it's like environmentally bad? Which is just, just strikes me as silly. Um, but again, if you live in a hurricane prone region, suddenly <laughs> all those corrugated panels you got to cut out for your windows and doors can be repurposed as hurricane shutters for every single opening you just cut out. Wow. So you're telling me that you, shipping container homes come with free complimentary hurricane shutters. Oh, wow. That's That sounds awesome. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to have to buy extra steel. I want to use the steel that's already there. So I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I tried to look up some more examples or what really wasn't that much. Uh, of like actual examples of people kind of reusing the corrugated panels as hurricane shutters. So, so what I think I'm going to do is So this is the, uh, just a little Word document. This is how I do a lot of the planning for this shipping container home. Sort of write everything down, organize. Um, and the main focus of this document is on windows and doors. So I've done some basic research already. Impact versus regular windows. Obviously, if I'm going to have, if I'm going to repurpose the container home cutouts as my hurricane shutters, I'm not going to need impact resistant windows um, yeah hmm. yeah so again i have my eyes set on a few uh doors these the windows and doors be able to submit your plans to the building if you have, you've got to know this the dimensions of all this stuff the, the structural engineer needed to know that so um, so I had to kind of go through this. So the, 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 and what I'm thinking now, it, I wasn't, it was hard to find back like a year ago when I was doing the research, it was kind of hard to find like a big ass 12 foot wide sliding glass door. So I would have had to do some kind of deeper digging a very common size of door. A sliding glass door is six feet wide. That's very common. <clears throat> so I figured you put two in together, you get about a 12-foot opening. <clears throat> Let me just confirm that that is the distance, at least here in the model. <clears throat> We're looking at about 142 inches. 
about 142 inches. And uh, if you come over here to this, uh, this is 72 inches wide. 70. It's a pretty straightforward thing. I mean, sort of a double paneled sliding door. Uh, of course, you combine this to two of them back outside shortly. And I'm going to put some rough tape marks so uh, to the exact size here. Rough, still a bit rough, just so I can get a visual sense of what's going to have to be cut and all that. Um, so, again, let me pull out the uh, calculator here. See, let's see, let's see what we got here. 142 divided by 12. So that's uh, 11.83 feet. So it's almost 12 feet. Now, if you remember, I think sometimes it's, it's hard. This is uh, one of the windows I was considering. 47.5 by 35.5. And I don't, you know, because apparently from what I've researched so far, when you cut the opening for a window, you want the, you want the opening to be a little bigger than, than this. And it's very small. It's like a half inch or something like that, but a half inch split on, on both sides of the opening. So like a quarter inch on the bottom and a quarter inch on top, you're out. Um, you know, how, 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 I think I have a document here pulled up. Yeah, I mean, here, I mean, just right here, that does it here. Rough openings. And I think it mentions it here. Uh, inspect a rough opening. Verify the width and height of the window or each half inch to five eighths of an inch smaller than the rough opening width and height. Maximum allowable deviation from square is eighth of an inch. So, you know, you got to, you know, there's all these little kind of specific things that need to be sort of figured out. So I don't know when, when you go to Home Depot.com and it says 45.75 by 35.5. Is that the actual size? I'd already looked this up. I actually kind of forgot the answer. I can't remember. Actually, I think it was sort of undecided. It was hard to tell whether it was the actual size of the window itself or if that's how big the the opening should be. It, I downloaded the little manual that the, the and it, it was just it was not very clear information. It was one. It was this one right here, I think, and it it was it was just a bunch of diagrams. It's kind of hard to tell which one applies to which model. So again, more digging needs to be done. More digging needs to be done. Um, so I think, uh, hmm, I think that. <clears throat> yeah, that's interesting. So 72 inches. So if that's true, then that's 12 feet. I mean, that's, that's, that's 12 feet total. 72 times 2 is 144. 144 divided by 12 is 12. <clears throat> it's 12 feet. It's a 12 foot opening. And it's a total of 144 inches. If that is the actual dimensions of the door, final, truly accurate, that's what it is. Now, let me go back to the model. I, I forgot the number. How wide was this opening here? Let's check again. Let's check again. Give it a second. It's kind of, it's kind of, yeah, there you go. It's back. It's back. Okay. Oh, well, I'll say thanks to everybody again for tuning in, smashing the like button. Apparently that helps. YouTube likes it when people hit the like button. So 
Um, and again, let's get the measurement one more time. Let's find that green, that yeah, beautiful green. I'm gonna have to go up a little bit. When, when the line turns green, I don't know if you can see it. See the line, there's like a black line there. And then at a certain point, it changes color and becomes green. It's, it's kind of hard to see the green. That means that you're, there it is, there's the green. That means that you're on a very, you're on a straight axis. So you're not measuring like at a, at a slope. All right, let's go. Yeah, it, it's looking like we're getting, wow. So we're getting, in the model, it's a hundred and, it's, it's 142 and 9 16 So that's like 142 and a half inches, which is interesting. That's interesting. That's interesting because that would be two inches short of a span for your standard. Uh, well, it would be an inch and a half short of the of the span if I were to go with two of these six foot wide doors. Again, I got to download the manufacturer's specs to really confirm. I can't recall if I did that. I'm pretty sure I did. Um, downloaded that and, and really got the actual manufacturer's specification. So again, I'm not going to do that now because that just seems tedious and boring. <laughs> so check that. All right. So yeah. Okay. So and for example, I mean, same thing with the with the windows. Uh, all the windows are the same size. I like to keep things simple. If, if you can't tell by the very straightforward <laughs> three rectangles put together. I just I just want to keep it simple. Just get it done. A house that gets the job done. I'm not... So we come here and I believe... Let's double check here. And, and again, to be clear, the model... Um, the model is very accurate, and so is the plans. And I'm probably going to check those as well to see. So this is showing 48 and 3 64th of an inch. So it's 48 inches. So this is a 48 inch wide window. And again, that was that's sort of the thing. Like when I was planning all this out a year ago, making the model, finalizing the dimensions of everything. You know, you need. I, I'm like, what's the standard size of a window? Because if you if you're just gonna buy a window that some company makes, it's got to be in a size that's common and that that's available. So, basically, these are all based on very standard, commonly used dimensions. Um, Forty-eight by. Come down, measure the bottom here. 48 by 36. 48 by 36. So that's adding up. That's adding up with a common window size. Well, actually, not exactly. <laughs> because the model says 48 by 36 inches, but as you can see, some windows are 47.5. By 35.5. And you go into another model of a very similar kind of window, and it just says 48 by 36 on the description. So again, you gotta make sure this isn't like dimension, this isn't like freaking lumber, that a two by four is actually a 1.5 by 3.5. You gotta make sure you're getting the actual dimensions. Then again, when you're talking like half an inch, does it does it really matter? <laughs> Does the, does, the, does the opening of the window really matter if it's... Okay, we got Alaska Ruzz up in the chat says, 48 by 36 is the rough opening. Huh. Interesting. So you, so you think that, like, for example, on a Home Depot page, when the title of the product says 48 by 36, you, you, you think that that's... They were referring to the rough opening. I mean, that would be a good idea for people who... Okay. Oh, see. Oh, oh, there you go. You see, 
47.5 by 35.5 is the actual window size. Gotcha. See, that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. And actually, if that also applies with the alleged 72 by 80 inch, then, um, then that actually might explain that little discrepancy over there. Um, but again, it all comes down to the model of, uh, of door you use. And there are different sizes. For example, the back of the house is actually a different size. This was, a, this was one of the issues I came up with a structural engineer. The, the front of the house is going to be about a 12-foot wide opening, uh, you know, roughly speaking. The back of the house is about 10 feet. And it was, a, you know, he's just like endlessly going back and forth. But the reason that that happened, I had no reason to make the back door smaller than the front. I don't know, why would I ever do something like that? Just make them both the same. But I had to do it. According to the engineer, the, the doors could not be too close to the edge of the container. I, you know, he, he said he cited some code. That was his job. I, I don't know what he was talking about. So because of that, the, the the back door and the front door they had to be they had to be moved away from the edge so I, originally i had them way closer way closer to the edge can't can't do it so now but the problem was with the back door is that when you move the back door over like this the back door starts to collide with this room over let me let me uh let me hide the ceiling Let's hide the ceiling there. Um, the back door, if the back door was 12 feet, yeah, there you go, that's perfect. If the back door was 12 feet wide and it had to start here, it would have cut into this room over here. It would have cut, see you see how the, the door literally just stops right here? It stops right at, the, at, the, at this, this room here. So it, it, it just had to be done that way. Um, I had to make the wall. So either, either I made the back door, either I kept the back door the same size, but then I would have to move this wall in over. I'd have to move it over and make this room smaller. I felt like this room right here, this is like the absolute minimum size. Like I, I think I looked up the standard size of a room and this was like right there. So I didn't want to make it any smaller. And by the way, hang on. It, it, uh, this this, uh, this electrical panel here, this electrical panel, the control panel, I'm thinking about right here, you know? You know, what a deal, and it doesn't uh, cause issues with uh, code or county-related stuff to just put the control panel over here inside of this room. Um, and you know, this room, well, I might, I might put it, I might put an extra container on top one day and this might be kind of like a stairwell into the second room. I don't know. We're going to, that's the future, right? So that's the story. Uh, to, thank you for pointing that out in the chat. Um, again, I'll have to, oh, that's great. So it looks like, it looks like you already had to go down that rabbit hole. Very interesting. Well, thanks. I'll keep that in mind. Um, so again, these are the little things. So that that's the idea. So let's see here. Um, here sort of briefly was just do a little bit of forecast planning. Just a little bit of sort of rough uh, brainstorming about what I know already here of the containers together is like just it's it's like the first step. You know, welding the corners of the container together using the come along to squeeze the containers together. Yeah, that's 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 the first thing. Um, actually, I had a rough secondary document here. Let's see here. In the come along. Manual that came with it. It's a Harbor Freight. It's a it's an it, that heavy duty. <laughs> it took almost no effort to, to squeeze the containers together. Um, so <laughs> we probably could have gotten away with like a two ton, but either way, so that, that's, that's what it looks like there. 
So you just use that. You use that, and and so the results came back positive. Uh, everything everything's pretty much straightforward there. So that's the first step. Squeeze the containers together and weld corners. And what that's going to do is it's going to put the entire house into a real sort of final, unmovable position. It's it's going to help. It's, it's going to add rigidity to the structure, no doubt, in my mind. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of speculation I had. As you can see, there's a lot of walls, you know. A lot of container walls have to be cut out. I mean, as you can see over here, there's uh, there's still some leftover container wall that's still hidden in this in this wall here, in the, in the drywall wall. <laughs> I'm just saying the word wall a million times. Um, but then, obviously, when you come over here, I had to cut out this whole section of wall. This whole section of container wall had to be cut out. So, you know, there was a lot of speculations. I was like, well, what, you know, I heard that when you start cutting out container walls, the, the whole container, like, you will like flex and buckle a little bit. But after some research, I came to the conclusion that there wouldn't be that much to cause a problem with the already welded corners that I plan to do first step, first step. These corners here, weld them together. Boom, 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 and then of course on the other side. I came to the conclusion that cutting the walls out um, would not cause any kind of crazy deflection or twisting. That it would like I don't know maybe break the welds that I already did here off. I, I don't. I, I I highly doubt it. I, I did some research. I looked at a lot of videos. I was looking at a video from Life Uncontained. And I was watching when they, because they literally cut out the entire walls, the entire 40 foot length of wall, they chopped it off. I still have some pieces of the container wall still left on all sides, as you can see here and here. And from what I gathered, this is just what I gathered based on limited information in, in, in the video from Life Uncontained that I saw. Um... It wasn't until they were, because they, they would cut it off in chunks. So they do like, I don't know, like a, a 10 foot section, chop it off. Then they chop off the next 10 foot, chop it off. The next 10 foot, chop it off. And it, it looked like it wasn't the last 10 foot section. When they'd already sliced, angle grinded off the bottom of the wall. And it was just hanging by the top. That you would finally start to see this top rail here actually kind of flexing and kind of bouncing a little bit you know when, when there was still that last 10 foot piece left everything still looked really like i see you know, i see them like walking through the containers it wasn't really it seemed to me so i believe that i believe that leaving these in these little pieces of leftover container wall i believe that that's actually going to give it just enough so that there isn't any kind of crazy flexing because that was the thing. It's like, do I weld before or after I cut the walls out? Maybe I should cut the walls out for, first, let the container do its thing, and then weld. You know, this is, but I, I'm, I'm pretty confident in, in the approach that I'm using right now. So, um, so that that's that's like the next first step. Welding all these four corners, technically eight corners, on both sides together. That's the next step. After that, now what comes? Well, cutting the walls out. Um, I, right now, that's that's the next thing on the list is cut the walls out. Um, but I'm going to cut the walls out, obviously, before I start sealing, you know, with caulk and spray foam or whatever, the gaps between the containers, the, the big lengths, the big 40 foot lengths up here between containers as you can see here there's a gap there there's a gap you see the gap there's a gap you got to seal that <clears throat> right now my method for sealing this gap is um i'm gonna repurpose some of the walls that i cut out i'm gonna repurpose them i'm just gonna cut some strips long strips and then i'm uh, i need 40 foot length 40 feet of corrugated walls into little 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 pieces of thin strip steel and then i'll lay that on top of here the entire 40 foot length from here to there stitch weld the entire length 
get some more leftover container wall cutouts and use them over here as well. Use them over here the entire length. Um, before that, in the gap, I think I'm going to put some backer rod. A little bit of backer rod. It's this thing that it, it, it provides a little bit of support when you add caulking on top. I'm going to use some tight bond. Uh, it's not silicone. It's actually called an advanced polymer. It's not silicone. Um, it's called an advanced polymer. And they claim that it's more, it's better than silicone. Um, it's, you know, it, it has more stretch factor. So if there's any movement in the building, the caulking, the tight bond caulking has a little bit of flex stretchability. You want it to have some stretchability because if there's movement in the building, you don't want the seal to just crack open and break. So I'm going to use some tight bond. So back a rod to give a foundation sort of <clears throat> for the tight bomb, tight bond caulking. Then you just put a pretty thick layer there of that tight bond caulking. This is this is all for water sealing. This is all this is all to keep water out. Then I'll take the leftover cutouts of steel from the container. I'll cut them into long strips and just lay it two to three inches wide max. In fact, I could probably pull it off with just the front face because you know you see that you see you see like. The container sort of, hang on, we need a better, need a better side here. Yeah, there we go. As you know, obviously it's a corrugated, it goes in and out, in and out and out. Probably just the face of one of these would do it. The face of one, just like this right here. So I'll just take an angle grinder. Uh, on the roof, it doesn't have to be pretty because you can't see it on the roof. So I can probably, I could just whoop out the angle grinder, just like rough, just, you know, just, just cut this thing out. Um, and again, so again, that's a, that's a criticism. Some people lob at contain, container homes. Oh, you have to cut out all the steel. You never use it. Well, first of all, I don't know about you, but just having a bunch of steel lying around sounds very useful to me. Like that could be used for so many things. But second of all, um, I mean, you can literally repurpose it onto the container home itself for so many different needs. It's amazing. Now on the side, the side of the house, the gap here. It's going to be roughly the same idea. It's going to be roughly the same idea. I'm just going to take another panel. I'll probably be a little cleaner, a little more precise with those cuts because it's a lot more visible. And you just strip it down all the way here. Weld it. I'll probably put a backer rod and some tight bond in there too before. And then um, obviously after you put the metal on top of the rail and you weld it that entire distance, after you put the, the panels on top, the, the cutouts for the whole 40 foot length. And after you stitch weld the whole way, I'll use the tight bond that I had in here already. I'll use more of that to seal to seal the uh, the uh, the point between the strip metal, strip steel, and, and the container roof itself, the, the top rail. And I'll just seal that. And then on top of that, <laughs> and then on top of all that, for the entire roof, I'm going to put Henry's Tropical 887 silicone sealant for the whole damn thing. So that's like, yeah. So anyways, that's the idea. Uh, Alaska up in the chat, I don't know what your container home is like. Do you have any, Is, is does your container home have two containers coming together at any point? If so, what is your plan to seal them? What's your plan to, to seal them? Um, if you're still in the chat, I don't I don't even know if you're still in the chat. Um, Gerald says, are you using Glula interior beams for your cutouts for structural support? Glula interior beams for your cutout structure. Right. Um, interior. I don't know what I don't know what a Glula. <laughs> I'm going to Google it real quick. I don't know if that's a typo or I mean let, let's find out. Let's let's find out. I know that I'm probably gonna have to do some structural reinforcement for these openings here internally. 
even though I still have leftover walls, container walls, and even though I'm going to have giant ceiling rafters running along that are going to be connected to the top rails over here. Uh, oh, I guess you mean glue laminated. Is that what you mean? Glue laminated? Glue laminated, I guess that's what you mean. <laughs> I, I typed in glue lam, and, and this is what I got. Glue laminated timber. So I, I think that's probably... Yeah, there Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, for the most part... Let me see if I can pull it up in the model here. For the most part, that is basically what the ceiling is. Um, but you're talking about reinforcing the openings. Um, let, me, let, me, let me get the... Uh, where where is it? How how do we do this again? Oh yes, here we go. Good old layer section. Um. Yeah, roof beams and ceiling. Here we go. Um. Right. Okay. So okay, so obviously, these are the wooden roof rafters let's hide the drywalls of the ceiling uh, there you go and obviously so that i mean first of all as far as i mean i don't glue lamin let, let's let, 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 let glue laminated timber also abbreviated glue lamb is a type of structural engineered wood product constituted by layers of dimensional lumber bonded together with durable moisture in north the material provided the laminate term laminate stuff there a highly innovative construction material. Pound for pound, glue lamb is stronger than steel. Wow. But is it lighter than an I-beam? That's the question. Because, you know, that's the whole idea with the I-beam, right? And, and there's actually uh, there's actually wooden I-joists, they're called. Um, it's like engineered wood that looks like an I-beam. Because, you know, that eye shape apparently is actually like physically speaking, it actually is. It's the eye shape that really gives it the strength over such a long span, despite being a fairly. You know, a fairly. Not overdone material. It, it, it's part of what gives it its strength. You know, it's not. It's not like. It's not like you need a solid steel <laughs> beam that runs twenty feet and weighs an insane amount. You can just have kind of elegant eye shape, and it's extremely strong that way. I'm not sure if it's stronger than a <laughs> a solid bar of steel running ten feet, but it's certainly not as heavy. Um. So it, it, let's let's see here. What this is. Because that's one thing that I'm not sure is specified. Uh, if my structural engineer specified that in the plans, it might be just a given. Um, I know that a lot of people, I've heard, I've seen people put tube steel. They'll put like a tube just right here. They'll just put like a big piece of tube steel. Um, like, for example, I, I let's hide the I-beams here for a second. Um Obviously, this is where the container cutout starts. And then it's just the container wall is completely cut out this entire length. I saw one dude, he just got a piece of tube steel and just ran it um, from the floor straight up to the top rail up here. And I think that was that was basically his structural reinforcement. Obviously, I think he had one on the other side, too. Um let me let me get the hell out of here. There we go. Um, but uh, the only real specification for my structural engineer was the openings on windows and doors. Um, unless he basically assumed it was for all openings. Uh, my plan. Let me see if I can pull out the. Uh, hmm. I won't be able to pull that out, but. My plan for the openings, at least for the windows and doors, was not to use tube steel to reinforce the openings. A lot of people were using tube steel in the early days, but uh, I've seen people advance to using angles, angle steel. And they literally just 
fit it up against the opening. It provides even even provides like a really good flange. It's more lightweight. It's less steel than using tube steel around the entire opening. Um, so, yeah, but actually, to be honest, I don't, I don't know how glue lamp. So let me go back to your chat message. Are you using glue lamp interior beams for your cutouts for structure reinforcement? Interesting. I, um, I don't know, to be honest. In fact, I don't even know. I don't even know really what is the benefit of glue lamb over just a normal beam. Is that is that something you think should should be or could be used specifically for a container cutout? Or is that just a normal beam that's used like any beam, like, for example, just a normal ceiling rafter? Is, is, that, is that something that could be used for a normal ceiling rafter? Or is that something, you know, so. One thing I will say, though, one thing I will say, though, Hang on, sometimes sometimes SketchUp gets uh, frozen. One thing I will say, though, is that Alaska Russ says, I'm putting a flat roof on top of my kitchen using 2 by 6 on 12-inch centers and the top made roof. Ah, very interesting. Very so Alaska already used angle steel. Good. Yeah, it, it, seems, it's a much, it seems like a much more refined um, way to do it the tube steel seems so cumbersome so excessive cutting out large sections of 20 foot wall then use some of the gulam <laughs> the... so do you do you mean like parallel with uh, does what it... i don't know anything uh, that might be something i run into and run into very shortly very soon so okay very cool so that next um but maybe not Because if I cut the walls out, I only meant cut out the interior walls of the shipping container. You know. The, the reason that I wanted to do... The reason that I wanted to seal the gaps... Um, I don't want that to happen. Obviously, uh, it obviously trumps... I mean, maybe the amount of walls that are being cut out you got this whole span here. You got this chunk here. You got this chunk there, chunk over here. That's obviously way more than, you know, the front and the back door and some window. So I guess what I'm thinking now is, well, what if when you're cutting out the wall, just... Wait, so at, at that point, it would be sealing the gaps around the shipping container. Yep. And then maybe... Today, the next the next step what would come next what would come next it seems like alaska abouts you have to be very precise with your cut eye yeah i just wonder i wonder if uh i don't think i'm moving on to installing the studs yet that's for sure um, and I, and, but I, I think the spray foam insulation actually comes, that's actually one thing I don't know. Cause I am leaning towards spray foam insulation. Um, let's find that out real quick. I don't, I don't know when the uh, spray foam comes. I, I think spray foam happens after you put the studs in. Let's, uh, find out here real quick. Modern home project. Let's see here. I don't even remember what kind of insulation this dip this guy did. I don't even think he did spray foam, did he? Here's an idea. Let's go straight to the Google.
I guess if the stud is landing the part of the corrugated wall that sticks out, it's one of the very good answers on Google either. But that's interesting. So Alaska says you would spray foam after the studs. Controlled spray. I mean, I've seen some videos of it, but it must be a very controlled spray. So that you're just not completely spraying it all over the studs. All right, so let's uh, keep forecasting here. So okay, that that's possible. Um, now the now the big question is: Do you spray foam <laughs> before or after you put the doors in and the windows? You install the windows. I'm gonna guess you do it after. So if we just take Alaska's uh, message at face value, we start with studs, or maybe not start with studs, but we do the studs before the spray foam. And then I, I suppose maybe you can start, you know, doing the studying that the studying framework that goes around windows and doors, the whole little intricate thingy. Maybe install the windows and the doors. And now, and now, I mean, Jesus, God, you almost have a, you almost have a house at that point. Now the, but then, okay, okay, what, what comes, what comes? No, well, obviously the electrical wiring has to be after the spray foam. Obviously, I'm not even gonna ask. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it would come after the spray foam. You know, unless you want your wires totally covered in spray. Um, so that, that would be interesting. That'd be interesting. So cut all the openings out. Now, that's a question. Electrical and plumbing before spray foam, says Gerald. Hmm. That's interesting. That's counterintuitive for me. Um, that was actually suggested by Google as a question. <clears throat> Spray foam before or after electrical. <laughs> Let's see. <clears throat> wow. No way. Wow. Getting to know foam. Typically, roughen electrical will be done before spray foam is applied with the final connection of fixtures and other devices occurring afterwards. <clears throat> However, it, it is often impossible to avoid running at least some circuits in insulated walls after the spray foam has been completed. That's interesting. Why? Why? That's... Hmm. That's that's interesting. Gerald says that they would be encapsulated. Bill says life uncontained is doing plumbing and electrical before the spray foam. What the hell? Wow, that's counterintuitive as hell. Part of the reason it feels counterintuitive to me is because I I, I mean, if you just look at this picture right here, I mean. It, it, it kind of kind of says everything you need to know about what comes before what comes after um, because I mean look at it I mean it's the, the spray foam it looks like the spray foam literally fills cavities between the studs all the way up to your your drywall or your shear wall I didn't know that you know I had it in my head that the spray foam would maybe be an inch or two thick, but there'd still be a bit of a cavity to run. But looks like, I mean, at least on this random picture, it's just right up to the face of that stud, those stud walls, the framing. And obviously in that case, you have no space to run wires, let alone plumbing, obviously. I mean, I understand the plumbing. Okay, well, that's interesting. So you, you would literally just cake all your electrical wiring and spray foam. Wow. What happens if you have to like replace the wire or something? <laughs> Holy crap. I mean, I guess that's fairly rare occurrence, but I mean, if you go back here, um, He does say, however, it is often impossible to avoid running at least some circuits 
in insulated walls after the spray foam has been completed to avoid running at least some circuits. So I'm not, I guess that means, I don't know, maybe if you want to come, you, you got a couple circuit breakers to your panel or something, you need to run a few more wires. I mean, yeah, because there's no, uh, what do you, you got to do? You got to cut a hole out of the spray foam. Damn, that's, that's pretty crazy. Else you would use a conduit. Yeah, I've seen in so fast. Yeah, I've seen in so fast. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. So that's insane. So you're telling me that after cutting out all the openings, maybe I would start studying. Maybe I would start putting the, the, the framing in. This is this is rough. Obviously, this is a very rough sort of forecast. I just want to kind of get a feel for what might be coming down the line, because there's probably going to be a lot of like little, just micro little things that need to be done in between all this. Now, that's one question I have. Is yeah, I mean, without a doubt. As I think of it off the top of my head, the windows and doors have to come after you complete the, the, the framing. No doubt about it. It has to come afterwards. Because as far as I know, the windows and doors are they 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 are secured into the studding, into the wooden framework. So that so yeah. So the studding is like first, first, first up. Then I guess I could put in windows and doors. Now the question is okay, well, how about this though? What comes first, windows and door installation or spray foam? I don't think it would make a difference. You'd probably have to cover up the windows and doors to avoid getting spray foam. Alaska in the chat says two inch of spray foam is common and some regular some regular batting on top, but trying to drill all the holes for wiring after foam would be terrible. Yeah, that, I agree. That sounds horrible. Um, I just assumed there would be enough of a cavity to still run some, you know, you know, run your, well, what is it? 12 gauge? I can't remember. I got to go back and double check. 12. Run your Romex through. Run your Romex through. Very interesting stuff. I got to say that's, that's a, hmm. Man, what if you, but you know, I guess now that I think about it, you know, how often does anybody want to run new cable through the, their walls? I mean, even if you didn't have the spray foam in there, how would you even run some, some, some new Romex through? You, you got your drywalls in the way. I mean, I, I suppose you can maybe cut a little hole out. I mean, I, I yeah. Yeah, that's a bit vague for me. It's a bit, bit vague in my mind, that one. So, yeah, I wonder what the chat has to say. Um, windows and doors, before or after the spray foam? Gerald says you can run conduit channels and spray foam afterwards. Hmm. Pretty interesting. Okay. So at that point, what would come next? Before. Windows and doors before the spray foam. I think that's what Bill's referring to. But I wonder if it doesn't matter. I wonder if it can sort of inconsequential. Okay, so next. What would come next? So let's say, let's just say... You, you put all the studs up. Okay, you cut out all the openings. You put all the studs up. It's going to be insane. It's, it's going to be crazy. I, and I got to order lumber and I got to cut. And it's going to be, it's going to be a circus. <laughs> it's going to be a circus. Um, so you stud everything up. You stud everything up. You install your windows and your doors. You spray foam. You wire and you plumb. <laughs> you wire and you plumb. Maybe. 
Not sure if this is the exact order yet. Um, and I, I guess then you, then you spray foam and you cake everything in a permanent <laughs> a permanent layer of spray foam. And and then and then what do you do? Is it time to start shear walling and drywalling? That's crazy that electrical is going to be done before the drywall. Like, if that's a very obvious one to me. But it's going to be pretty intense doing the whole electrical. Even though I learned so much about electrical when I built the electrical meter box pedestal. Um, but, but, yeah, I'm going to have to go down. I'm, I'm going to have to go down that rabbit hole before I even start sealing walls up. Wiring and plumbing, drywall, yep. You don't want to weld after spray foam. Alaska Russ says it would be easier to spray foam before windows and doors, but either way, what's interesting. Why would it be easier? Alaska? Because I was wondering if there was a better way, better order to do it. And I was wondering if there potentially could be a smarter route. Um... You know, I, I guess you don't want to spray a bunch of foam on the windows and the doors because you won't have to cover all the... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, so it's like you could do it before if you want to, but it's not necessarily the end of the world if you do it after you install the windows and doors. Other than that, you would have to go back in and cover up the windows and doors. God forbid you spray a bunch of spray foam over them. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Um, yeah, the wiring, that's going to be crazy. And then, and my, my question is, at what point am I like basically done? <laughs> that's my question. At what point am I like, okay, I'm basically done. <laughs> you know, drywall is a lot of work, but is there, how much more is there after that? I mean, okay, yeah. And then you start getting into the more kind of superficial surface layer stuff, like installing cabinets. Um, I still have to paint the outside of the container. You know, I got to choose a paint color. I got to treat all the rust. You know, that, that, might, that might be something I do, you know, early on. I'm not sure. Uh, oh, oh, don't forget your HVAC. Don't forget your HVAC. Don't forget your HVAC. I'm using, uh, I'm using mini splits. <clears throat> I'm using mini splits. Air conditioners, air conditioning units. We got one over here. We have one over here. Well, that comes up. Little air handling unit. And we have a third and final one over here. Had to go back and forth with the MEP guy for a while on the best location for all of these. The best location for all of these, uh, these these structures, these air handling units, and you know, um, you know, it was uh, it was because uh, you know I, I want I didn't want to I didn't he he wanted he wanted to put an air handling unit just in the bathroom. He wanted an air handling unit just in this bathroom. This is about this bathroom because I, I don't care about bathrooms like just I, I you just give me what i need right I, I, this is like the bare minimum size of a bathroom basically um and he wanted to put an air handling unit just inside of here because i guess he figured it's in a little corner and it's going to be there's going to be a door so even if you have an air handling unit in the bedroom there's no way that the air is going to be able to get in there but we actually, we, we did a lot of back and forth, and um, it's in the MEP plans. I don't think it's here in the model, but in the mechanical, electrical, plumbing plans, I believe we're putting a, I think he called it a transfer grill. It's like a vent up here above the doorway, and it's supposed to allow airflow in and out. Um, that or... 
that or he said, yeah, I'd have to go back and look at the MVP plans, but I think he also wanted to put a transfer grill here as well, right above this doorway. And that way, this air handling unit over here in the corner, you know, this air handling unit would function to provide a little more air conditioning on this side of the house, but also would would have like a double purpose so that it would blow air kind of straight and it would make its way into this room right in front of it. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was a lot of back and forth with the MEP engineer. Uh, I have to go back and double check if he had a transfer grill up here. I don't remember. Transfer grill, grill is basically just a fancy name for like a little air vent, little like a little vent. Um, so, HVAC is another one, you know, that's... <clears throat> And I, I guess I'd have to kind of go back and double check what heating, ventilation, and air conditioning requires. But now that I think about it, HVAC, when you're using um, these mini splits, man, it's really, it's really straightforward. It's right in and right out. So it's not like I'm running air vents through the ceilings and and you know it's just a little a little little a little a couple little tubes right in and out right between the wall and the air handling unit so um yeah 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 so that 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 you know if i spray foam before i put the air handling unit i'm sure all i got to do is drill a little hole through the spray foam if i already spray foamed it up you know i don't i don't think i'm not sure that would but again these are the things you have to you have to think about um uh alaska says yep keep in mind that spraying spray foam is very temperature sensitive needs to be above 70 degree fahrenheit from what i've learned Gerard is correct. Make sure all welding is done before spray foam. It will melt or catch fire. Wow. Damn. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, one question I had was sort of a general question was. And maybe you guys in the chat have an opinion on it. Was. Does a. Obviously, a shipping container home requires, you know, you need to learn a little bit of welding. I know that for a fact. I, I've already used some welding. Um, and obviously, I'm going to have to weld the shipping container itself to the steel plates. I'm going to be welding these strips of steel from the cutouts as panels to cover the gaps. I'm going to be what to cover the gaps between containers. I'm going to be doing welding there. Um, I have to weld the angle seal um, together to form the reinforcements. But what about on a traditional home? Uh, in fact, I don't even know of any other welding I have to do after that. But in a traditional home build, you know, uh, concrete masonry unit or like a, like a wood frame type house, is there any welding required in those other kind of traditional home builds. I'm just curious because that's one of the criticisms people like to lob at shipping containers. I was like, oh, you have to learn how to weld. It's like, yeah, that's true. Even though welding is very useful. I mean, I'm, you know, it'll probably come in handy, but it's not like I'm going to be using it every day. It might come in handy one day. Um, but I'm just, I'm just wondering, like in a traditional home build, is welding required? I'm I'm just curious if you guys have an opinion on that if you happen to know. Um Wow, no welding in traditional houses here in the USA. Really? So you can go the whole So when you guys say that um I should weld before I put the spray foam, you're you're, pro you're probably talking about sort of the angle steel that's going to reinforce the cutouts and stuff. That's I'm literally going to be welding right onto the house itself. That's the kind of stuff you guys are talking about. Yeah, it's actually funny because I do remember now. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, they're, yeah, they're obviously most are stick built made out of wood, right? 
but I was just wondering if maybe at some point, you know, maybe when you're fleshing out the interior of the house, you're, you're running some wires or somewhere there might be welding needed. Um, but yeah, may, maybe not. So I guess that's a, that's a DIY advantage in traditional homes. You don't have to learn the, the art and the science of welding because boy, is it a science and it's an art. It's an art. You have to have the, <laughs> you have to have the steady hand of a painter. Um, and it, and it's a science too. It's almost like being a wizard. <laughs> well, welding is almost like being a wizard. You're like, you're wielding electricity. <laughs> it's cool, man. It's really awesome. It's fun. Some people make steel ex exterior decks and weld them together, but uncommon, right? Right. Well, there you go. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I couldn't think of anything off the top of my head in a traditional home that re would require welding. I couldn't think of anything. Ger Ger Gerald says you will want to weld your frames for openings before foaming. Depending on your client climate, you will need an ERV or HRV system for air exchange. Right. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to... I'm probably just going to do the front of the container home. I'm going to go back outside now to the container home. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take tape measure... And I'm going to take some duct tape. And I'm just going to put a little piece of duct tape at, at the four corners. Kind of rough of where the cutouts for the big front door is going to go. And the kitchen window is going to go. Because I kind of just want to get a kind of a feel in the real world. Not the model. Kind of like the kind of cutting I'm going to have to do the size of it, what's going to really be going on. So let me just, let me get a pen. I'm going to write down the dimensions of these things here. I'll just write on the back of this random business card. So what we have over here is a 12 foot, it's just rough here. It's a 12 foot, 12 foot wide front door. 12 foot by, yeah, let's just, let's just, let's just be safe here. Let's just measure it out of the model. Let's just measure it out of the model. Hey, Alaska, do you have a 3D model in your container home build or any type of any type of drawing plans or anything like that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if you had to get it permitted. Maybe you, you live in a place where you can just kind of do whatever the heck you want. Oh, you do have a 3D model. That's freaking awesome, dude. Did you make it yourself? Did you hire somebody? Just curious. Biggest issue with welding is not overheating the metal and burning through the container. I've learned that spot welding is the key. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, 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 right. The biggest issue with welding is not to overheat the metal and burning. Yeah, well, yeah. And of course, that depends on your amperage or your volts. Um, you know, uh, it's just there's so many factors. I mean, welding is insane. It was like three weeks of just nonstop researching just so I understood what I was doing. And I had to do a little bit of a, a little bit of welding on some of the, uh, some of the anchor bolts that was causing an issue. Um, it's like three weeks of just nonstop researching and then finding out what welding type, uh, it was insane, but I know to weld now. So that's cool. No permits. Really cool, man. That's awesome. Spot welding is a key. Yeah. You don't want to, you know, if you can spot weld, why not spot weld, you know, save yourself on some of that, that, uh, that, uh, that wire, <laughs> save yourself some of that wire. Um, 
welder setting is key. It took me many hours to dial in setting for the container walls. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I uh, the, the the little bit of welding that I did was for very thick, very thick steel, very thick. So I had no concerns about blasting through. Now the welding unit that I bought does kind of get you in the right place with some general some general like oh is it 16 inch <laughs> okay sorry about that <laughs> youtube just took me out <laughs> they, just, they just took me out of the stream so sorry about that uh <laughs> we're back um right and so when you when you're welding with a with a normal core the uh, the the welding unit kind of will get you in the, in the general location of the of the settings you should put it to. Um, mine it, it does weld to pretty thin, um, but yeah, that's 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 true. Um, I've I've heard it can be problems when you when you're starting with the really thin stuff when you're dealing with the really thin stuff. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, Alaska. You know, I have. Um, I have probably 15% battery. So I'm not sure my battery is going to survive. But I'll just run it to the ground. In fact, let me lower the brightness here while I get the dimensions before I go out there and uh, do what needs to be done. So, all right. So 12 feet by, I missed it. I think it's 80 inches. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's basically the same as your thingies. Yeah, so 72, so 12 feet, this is this, good, this actually counts continuously, thank God. 12 feet, which is 72 inches by 80 inches. 80 inches, right. So that is that now, but I also need to find out where it starts. Now, clearly... It literally is right on the top of the I-beam thingy. But from the very edge of the container, let's see where it uh, let's see where it begins. That's the problem with the edge of the container. It is slightly rounded. So we're gonna rough it. We're gonna rough it because this is just rough. So we're gonna rough it. Here. All right, that should do it. I'm going to put it, yep, yeah, right there. And then we're going to pull out and we're going to find out that distance. Looks like we're looking at 29 and a half, uh, 29 and a half inches from the side. Twenty nine point five inches from the side. <clears throat> from side. Yep, 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 yep. yep. <sighs> the Amish that run YouTube don't want you. Hey, Gerald, take care, man. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate your, your inputs, man. Thanks for live streaming. I love to read the other people's comments. We are all learning. This is a great resource. Thanks, man. Appreciate I appreciate your comments. I really do. A lot of people building container homes out there, man. It's crazy. Oh, breaking a lot of people. All right, so that's that. Let's, let's just focus on the front door. I want to really see what that's going to look like. So, we're heading back outside. Let me uh, increase the brightness here so I can see what's happening. Let's finish this off. 22% battery left. Let's finish it off. All right. Still pretty cold out there, I think. 
I need some pieces of tape. Now I'm gonna need a tape measure. Give me a sense of, give me a sense of what I'm dealing with, you know. Give me a sense of what I'm dealing with. Give me a sense of what I'm dealing with. Cause you know, this is gonna be, it's, well, <laughs> there's a lot that needs to be figured out still. That's what the month of December is for. And then once January starts, I have seven months till the RV camper permit expires. It expires July 2021, my RV camper. And I will no longer be allowed to live temporarily on my own land while building the shipping container home. They only give you a year. The county gives you one year to park a RV or RV camper like this one. Park it on your property and you get to live here temporarily on your property while you build your container home. The county gives you a year. They give you a year. So that expires. That year expires in about a little over seven months. Uh, July 2021. So in other, in other words... I'm trying to get this house done by July 2021. In other words, that's another way to another way to put it. Okay, how are we looking here? Let's get a good shot, you know. It's, yeah, it's all right. Let's pull back a little. That should do it. Yep, that'll do it. That, yeah, that. All right. Twenty-nine and a half inches from the side of the house. Quite the distance. Quite the distance, really. It's a 12 foot wide opening. This is the weakest 
That's a big ass door. That's quite the door. Wow, that's 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 what I was hoping. When I said I wanted a 12 foot wide door, that's what I was looking for. And of course, it's 80 inches height. Call it L. Wow. Oh, man, that's, that's high up. That's really high up. Wow. Oh,
That's a, that's a big opening, man. That's a big opening. It's, it's pretty big. I'm gonna have to cut that out in, in pieces. Oh man, let's see. Let's see here. Yeah, I mean, probably hard to see. Little pieces of tape are probably hard to see, but. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big opening. Let me, uh. <laughs> Flip flops on a winter coat, he was Florida man, basically. Yeah, it, it's it's it, it's it's not as it's it's a little warmer now now that it's like I don't know 10 30 11 or whatever time it is But it was absolutely frigid this morning <sighs> Sun is deceiving. I'm in the Midwest. So I said yeah, of course it is. All right, so I mean I mean yeah, I mean uh, the front door is from here, from here, to here. It, it, it's got some size to it. it goes all the way up there. It, it's a big chunk. It, it's, it's pretty big. That whole thing has got to come out. It's pretty interesting, actually. Let me step back and, and kind of get a macro of what that would look like. I think it's going to look really good. Like, yeah, I, I just think I just think it's I think, I think it looks good as far as like the way it looks on the house as a whole. I think it's a nice that nice kind of big glass opening is just nice. Uh, probably gonna cut it out in two or three chunks because it's first of all it's just easier to handle there's no way i would be able to handle a 12 foot wide section of of just giant corrugated steel that's just be smarter to cut it in maybe maybe in half six foot wide lengths <laughs> safety sandals yeah i mean i know i know that like who said that Mike, what's up, Mike? Uh, yeah, you know, I've worn sandals for so long that I feel, I feel pretty comfortable in them as far as like, like I, I, I know, I think generally they are definitely riskier. You know, they get caught in things and, but man, I, I just hate wearing shoes. <laughs> I just hate wearing shoes. The only, only time I wear shoes is like when I had to do a little bit of welding and they recommend you wear like, you know, leather boots or something. So I, I did put on some big boots for that, but otherwise I just, I hate shoes so much, man. I'll, I'll take the risk. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, there, so there it is. Seven months. You guys think I'll finish the house in seven months? You guys think I'll finish the house in seven months? What do you guys think? Seven months. I think it's, it's it'll it'll happen. I think I'll finish in seven months, and no problem. And that's considering I'm also spending countless hours in the editing room, <laughs> editing the videos, which are like documentary style just videos of the entire process of building the shipping container home that that takes time too so i think i'll be done in seven months no problem still a lot of work to do but i think i'll finish man i really do
Will you have some kind of window dressing for that enormous door? I know you're not in the boonies, but it, but still a private issue with that, that much glass. Oh yeah, of course. I'll probably have something. You know, there's you can you know, there's a, there's a million options. You know, I'll probably have some for that. What's up, Midwest Container? TJW, or T, yeah, TJW, TJWK is very well edited. Thank you, appreciate that. I do, I do take my time with the Think Outside the Container episodes. I take my time on those. I don't just want to smash all the footage I capture together. I think every episode has a certain vibe and a story to be told, so I kind of go with the footage I have. I, I don't want to, I don't like to make it run too long. Like, technically, every episode could be five hours long if I just throw all the footage in there. But I don't, I don't want it to get stale. So I do try to find the balance between informative and detailed, but still coming along and being interesting. I just finished the episode on the Sono Tubes, episode four of the Foundation series, episode 20 in the entire thing. And so that one is coming out. I'm thinking of releasing it tomorrow morning. Episode 20, foundation number four, the sono tubes. And that was put sono tubes in place that are literally the forms that get filled with concrete to make these concrete columns that hold up the container home. So that episode is probably coming out tomorrow. It's one of my favorites, actually. I really like the way it came out. I think my, my music choice was spot on this time. It's, it, it has a really great feel to it. Plus, I think is the sono tubes, you really start to see the foundation coming together, um, as opposed to just running a bunch of strings on batter boards. It kind of means nothing. Uh, so there it is, work in progress, shipping container home, on a homestead, whatever that word even means. Um, Alaska says, "Yep, it can be done in seven months, depending on weather and if you have enough time away from a job." Interesting. I wonder how long you've been working on yours, Alaska, and how long do you think you got left? So, yes, sir. Weather is mind-blowingly great right now. The sun came out. It's a little warmer. So, oh, man. It's... Is there a cloud in the sky? No, I don't think there is one. There's. No... I don't think there's a single cloud in this sky. Guy. Nope. Oh, it's freaking great. Triple G says, came for RPP, stay for the container home. This channel is way more informative than most that deal with this subject. You are just making a long Instagram video that looks pretty. You're teaching. Well, I, you know, there there is some, you know, it, every channel has its own vibe. And some seem to have a more storytelling, emotional angle. I like, uh, I like a little bit of both. I like telling a story about this journey I'm on but also actually explaining what the hell I'm doing. So, yeah, that's sort of the angle I was looking for, and people do tell me that, so I do appreciate that. Um, yeah, beautiful blue sky indeed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. T yeah, I mean, it can take a while, you know. Ten years is quite the lofty amount of time, but... The project you're working on is very huge. So it's understandable it might take a little longer. Um, I can't even remember how many containers you said it was. It was a lot. So there it is. Um, yeah. Okay, so that's it for today's live stream. I'll be doing more of these, obviously. Again, it's the month of December. And this is a lot of planning and just researching. So that's... There's not going to be much action going on in, in these live streams. But rest assured, come January, 
I'll be live streaming a lot more of this. Um, things that I think are safe enough to live stream. I, I want to be careful here. Like, I'm not sure I'm going to live stream welding. Even though I feel very confident, I've studied, I've researched, I've, I read the freaking welding machine manual like a thousand times just to be safe, just to be sure. Um, but, you know, you don't want to electrocute yourself live while everybody's watching. Um, and, and it just seems irresponsible. It's the same reason I didn't live stream Crane Day. I didn't live stream Crane Day because it, it just seemed like if something goes wrong, it just it, it seems irresp it, it's, it, it seems irresponsible from like a construction industry standpoint. Like you don't want to you just want to be careful. So I don't know if I'll ever live stream welding. Unfortunately, I would love to. Yeah, maybe we'll see. You know, you take the proper precautions. You make sure you ground that sucker. You make sure you ground that sucker. Uh, what else? What else? What else? But yeah, so I'll be doing a lot more. Cutting out the holes in the containers. Yeah, I'll probably live stream that. I don't know if I'll live stream cutting out the big walls inside because I feel like that could be a little risky too. Like you're taking out a lot of the structural component. I mean, I don't know how much the corrugated walls of the container are really that important for the structure. But I have heard you are compromising a little bit. So God forbid something crazy happens, you know. Yeah, so. But yeah, a lot more streams coming and they won't just be me talking and Googling stuff. I can't work in the winter. Too cold here in Alaska. Wow. You've been working on your container home for a year. I have a full-time job. Yeah, that doesn't give me all the free time I need in the plumbing. Wow, well, there you go. Yeah, I'm right now on the part-time job sort of thing part-time hours I guess you could say I guess you can call it freelance hours you know so and you know it's very flexible I can basically choose it as a freelancer you can kind of just choose whatever the hell you want to do so I, I get to kind of tweak it depending on okay I, do I foresee a ton of work coming this month yes I do on the container home so you know okay got to do less less freelance work this month but if I know that oh I'm, I'm this month I'm just waiting for the crane guy to call me back and then it's crane day like then I'll do a lot so you know it helps it helps to be able to have a flexible schedule um, Hey, remote work's the hottest trend of 2020. I heard some people are moving out to more rural areas because of remote work being the hottest new trend of 2020. Now that it's a thing. Now that it's not even, it's not, it's certainly not taboo anymore. It's, it's, it, it's indeed, it's the norm to work remotely. Uh, because of, you know, the, uh, the health scare of 2020. Um, the health scare of 2020. So that's changed things. So, you know. And I, I, I don't think it's just. I don't think it's just. You know. I think that I think the stigma of it has probably gone away a little bit probably seemed a little bizarre to do that oh you, you work from home it's weird you don't drive into the office every day that's weird well now nobody has a choice so now it's definitely not strange uh, and, I, and i heard that at least for some people they actually prefer to work from home i mean i heard that a lot of a lot of parents were choosing not to send their kids back to school um i heard that um and so now they're now the kids are learning remotely from home.
Man, this weather's too good. Um, so, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I mean, I heard like extroverts were, were hurting. The extroverts were having a lot of trouble uh, going with the whole remote work. They, they, they liked, they liked being around their, their peers. They like, they like, they like, they like the social aspect of it. And then all of a sudden they're like, no more, stay home. Stay home and learn to be an introvert. <laughs> introvert training, stay home. You must learn the ways. Well, you know, it's interesting because it seems like everyone's a homeschooler nowadays. It's very interesting. Obviously, the curriculum is still mandated from the top down, but they're not in they're not in school anymore. They're certainly learning from home. It's homeschooling in a, in a way. Um, and, you know, obviously, I, I feel like that was going to happen eventually, you know, but thanks to the, did we run out of battery? Oh, we're almost out of battery. But thanks to the um, the health scare of 2020, um, it seems like a lot of changes that were going to happen eventually were accelerated thanks to the health scare of 2020. Um, a lot of a lot of changes were accelerated. I mean, it's like I think that you know working from home was already gonna happen. It's in many ways it was already happening. Now, of course, not everybody can work from home. I get it. You know, if you build houses for a living, you got to show up to your you got to show up to the job site. But, anyways. I'm really low on battery. The screen went dark trying to save batteries. And I know I can't really see what the hell is happening. But all right. I'm at 5% battery. So again. Um, hey, I want to say thanks to everybody who tuned in. We're two and a half hours here into the stream. So I get thank you all. Thank you to Alaska. Thank you to TJ. Thank you to Midwest Containers. Thank you to Gerald. I mean, just... A lot of great uh, contributions, a lot of great ideas. Um, so yeah, I'll be doing more of these streams. Tomorrow, most probably, comes the next episode of Think Outside the Container, the official episode. So look forward to that. Click the bell icon and hit all if you haven't already, if you're not subscribed already, so that you're notified when that video comes out. And as always, guys, that's it. Thank you guys for watching. Yeah, I, sorry, Bill. Yes, Bill. Bill. I said Gerald. I think there was a guy, Frank, I believe. I hasn't, he hasn't commented for a while. Triple G, thank you as well. Thank you to everybody. So, again, all right, guys. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys soon. Later.